do. Hello and welcome to live programming here at the Moore Freedom Foundation. Uh, today we're going to be discussing uh, Saudi Arabia and specifically an aspect of, sorry, just a little setup here, specifically an aspect of Saudi Arabia that I don't think I've covered too much on this channel. Uh, I've talked a lot about their funding for religious extremism across the region. I don't think I've talked too much about their political model and the effect that that's had. Uh, for those of you who are new to this, um, the way this works, this is live programming. Uh, you may notice to the right of your screen, there's a live chat. Uh, you can participate with uh, folks. Uh, you can comment along uh, as I'm talking. Uh, I've got a presentation that's probably gonna be, well, I don't know, half hour, 45 minutes or so, uh, maybe a little shorter, maybe a little longer. And then after that, I'll start taking questions. So it'll be Q and A, we'll talk about whatever you guys wanna talk about. Um, I don't have the mental bandwidth to um, follow the questions in the chat while I'm talking. Uh, you know, I'm not, not as not as young as most of you folks. You know, I don't have that. I don't have that digital brain. Um, so uh, I'm gonna. Uh, so if you have a question, um, ask it again once the question and answer period starts. Uh, in the chat, um, you can be as vicious as you want uh, to me personally. Uh, talk all the shit you want about me. Um, but uh, please be civil to each other. Uh, don't, you know, don't dive in on each other. Don't uh, attack each other for where you're from. Uh, please discuss that sort of thing. If I notice that kind of egregious behavior out of the corner of my eye, I will block you. Um, so yeah, uh, there we go. So uh, let's go. Um, today, uh, I've entitled this uh, presentation, uh, Saudi Arabia's War on uh, the Arab world and Berbers too. Uh, I did a video last uh, week um, on Algeria, sort of why Algeria is stronger than you think. And uh, about half the comments were talking about how I had underestimated um, the body account in Algeria's independence war against the French. Uh, I had said 300,000 people. Um, uh, a lot of people, Algerians, uh, corrected me and said that it's 1.5 million people. These are numbers that are under some dispute. That was half the comments. The other half of the comments were people who were very angry that I had described Algeria as an Arab country um, because uh, many people in Algeria see themselves as Berbers, uh, sort of an indigenous group that was there before the Arab conquests 1400, 1300 years ago. Um, so yeah, that was uh, something that I stepped on. So I wanted to uh, mention Berbers as well in the title of this video. Um, but obviously, uh, as I talk about Saudi Arabia's effect on the region over time, there's extraordinary complexity here. Um, it, there's many more peoples and, and uh, uh, approaches and, and sort of cultural factors in the Middle East and North Africa than just the Arabs or just the Arabs and the Berbers. It, it's an incredible mix. Um, and Saudi Arabia has had a negative effect on all of them. Um, I don't think uh, uh, it's a surprise to anybody if I point out that sort of the general Middle East, North Africa region, or MENA as it's often referred to, um, and maybe that's a little too corporate speak, but you know, MENA is something that folks refer to, Middle East, North Africa. I don't think it's controversial or incorrect for me to say that it's a mess. Um, it's, it's kind of a disastrous region. Um, you know, it's... Uh, it's sort of known as where the wars are. Um, it's a place where representative democracy is almost unknown. Uh, it's one of the only places in the world where that's the case anymore. Um, Tunisia is the shining exception. I did a video on Tunisia about a month back. You should check that out. Um, but generally, I mean, yeah, there's all of the, I think actually even Saudi Arabia, all the countries have to some degree or another, some kind of parliament or something, but it's generally not, you know, that. Uh, sorry, also, I should say, Lebanon also has sort of a quasi-functioning uh, system of, of uh, parliamentary rule, but Lebanon is sort of its own, you know, very idiosyncratic thing uh, because of sectarian divides. So I think, I think it's fair to exclude that from like a sort of real functioning democracy definition. So anyway, most countries have some kind of parliament or something like that, but it, it doesn't, um, they're they have real power in very few places. Um, and also, I mean, it's, it makes it really easy, uh, the, 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 the status that uh, the Middle East, North Africa has, makes it very easy uh, for people to engage in sort of racist stereotypes. This idea that, oh, Arabs can't, um, Arabs can't be governed by democracy. There's something different about Islam or, or, 
or or the Arabs specifically that means that they're no good or they can't you know they they're they're too stupid they can't handle democracy they can't handle this form of government or to put it in a more positive way like there's just something in their character that doesn't I don't know whatever there's no positive way that I see it um, but that's that sort of pessimism and and sort of racism in describing you know the Arab world sorry the the broader Middle East North Africa region. Um, is very common uh, in the United States. And uh, what I want to focus on today is the way that Saudi Arabia actively pushes that racist idea about the Arab world. Um, that's, that's part of their, um, the propaganda that they push everywhere, both in terms of actually sort of outright saying that uh, or funding DC think tanks that outright say that. Um, you know, the, the, the DC think tanks can't be full on racist, but they're, oh, you know, they're just, they're just not ready for democracy or, 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 or something along those lines is how they put it. So Saudi Arabia just outright pushes that. And also, um, uh, through its interactions with individual countries, does its best to crush any attempt at better government. I mean, that's what Saudi Arabia has been doing. This, I think most of you are aware that that's what Saudi Arabia has been doing since the Arab Spring very obviously, but what I'd like to talk about today is the fact that that's what Saudi Arabia was designed to do. That's what Saudi Arabia has been doing since its founding in 1932 and uh, for decades before that, and obviously for all of the decades since. Um, so I think before I uh, jump in into another screed on you know how bad Saudi Arabia is for, well, everything um, in the region, I should mention there are other factors here. Um, there's the... Uh, um there is uh the uh there is the the there is israel um now what's interesting about israel is um it provides uh sort of a, a good foil for anybody who wants to do a bad job running an arab country you can just blame israel um and what i think israel does is it sort of does what trump does for maduro uh, maduro the sort of venezuelan president who is just really just doing an awful, awful job, has been saved by Donald Trump over the past two years because Donald Trump and the sort of belligerent morons that he employs provides such a perfect, um, a perfect bad guy, you know, for, for somebody sitting in Latin America. It's like, oh, look, it's this hyper-capitalist, you know, nutso imperialist who's actually saying he wants to overthrow our government. So all of a sudden, Maduro gets to be a hero. I think that sort of, uh, Israel plays the same role in the Middle East and has played that role for 70 years. Um, uh, it, it provides an excuse for people who are running the place poorly. Um, so that's definitely another factor. You know, it's not just Saudi Arabia, it's Israel as well. Um, it's also just generally imperialism and competition. I did a video a number of, uh, gosh, a couple of years back now, it's sort of why uh, I think Trump wants the world to look like the Middle East. And the reason that Israel, sorry, that uh, the Middle East is so screwed up is because unlike the rest of the world where the Cold War ended, um, the Cold War is still kind of going on in the Middle East and North Africa because you've got not two super powers. Um, luckily, the world is one of the happiest things that has happened to the entire world is the end of the Cold War. Um, I think it's common for people to look at that as just sort of like a European issue, but that's, that's not true. I mean, during the Cold War, during the 60s, 70s, and 80s, there were like 10 Syrias or 10 Yemens going on at any given time in Africa, in Asia, anywhere, because the Soviets were on one, you know, would fund one side and the US would fund the other. So that was horrible for the world. And since the end of the Cold War, just war and conflict throughout the world has plummeted. That hasn't been the case in the Middle East. There aren't two superpowers there anymore, but there are one superpower and a whole bunch of minor powers that are sort of propped up. Uh, I would argue, actually, it's sort of the uh, Iran is sort of propped up as a good enemy for the U.S. But anyway, it's a longer video and different different uh, discussion. But the Middle East has this this competition between Saudi Arabia, between Iran, between Israel, between Turkey, between the United States, and now Russia's kind of jumping back in again. And that also keeps um, the Middle East backward and dangerous. But the 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 main thing. Um, the main thing is Saudi Arabian policy. Um, and what I've talked a lot about on this channel is the way that Saudi Arabia's funding of religion, of its particular extreme version of Islam has created essentially the entire problem of 
radical Islamic terrorism. But as bad as that is, as bad as 9-11 is, you know, I'm somebody who lives in New York now and uh, you know, was born here, grew up here until I was nine in uh, New York City. Obviously, I take 9-11 personally, but far, far beyond that is the impact that this Saudi funding of religious extremism has had across um, not just the, the uh, Middle, uh, Middle East, North Africa, the sort of Arab world, but also across the Muslim world. Um, down, you know, down into sub-Saharan Africa, down into uh, places like Mali, Nigeria, um, uh, and off, you know, throughout the entire uh, Muslim world. It's been tremendously damaging. Um, but that's another big factor in the Middle East. But that's not what I want to talk about today. I don't want to talk about the religion. I want to talk about the fact that Saudi Arabia is a monarchy. Now, that's a, it's a weird, weird thing, not just in sort of our modern times or whatever, that there's a monarchy there. Um, but it's even kind of weird in um, sort of Muslim, the history of the Muslim world, that traditionally the, the idea of a king was something that they shied away from. You'll have emirs, you'll have sultans, you'll have this, that, and the other thing. But the idea of sort of a, a king was kind of a European concept. And it's kind of interesting because all of these, these monarchies, these Gulf monarchies, are in a weird way modeled after the British system. Um, because you know, you have these these kings in sort of, I guess not all of them are described as kings, but in Saudi Arabia, definitely described as a king. Um, you know, Oman, Qatar, uh, well, the United Arab Emirates. Um, but this version of monarchy um, is a very um, very European thing. And I think in Muslim history, if you're going to have a sultan, if you're going to have a monarch of this kind, there's going to be like a larger area that's being ruled. But this idea that it's very European idea, this sort of all these little little emirates, little emirates that are sort of run by their own distinct monarchs. And it's, it's all it's all very European in a weird way. But Europe, of course, has left it behind a long, long time ago. Um, so it's weird. It's not it's not only just weird in um, modern times, it's weird in, in the context of Muslim history as well. Uh, last week or so, The Economist did an article just on monarchy worldwide, and it was, it was pretty striking. Um, I think one of the things that allows us to um, sort of hide how weird this is, is that really only about a fifth of the world's monarchies are found in the Middle East. Um, you know, I think it's eight out of 44 was sort of the, 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 the count that I did that could, I'm, I'm sure that's wrong actually, because if you count each of the Emirates, then that's what 15 out of them. Anyway, it's, it's not like a dominant amount, but actually if you, if you look into the details of these 44 other monarchies, they have very few of them have any power at all. Um, I think in Thailand, that's one that's, I think that might be the only exception. And of course, there's the Sultan of Brunei, but that's sort of another sort of vaguely uh, uh, Islamic context. Um, I don't want to go down that rabbit hole. Anyway, um, but the, with very few exceptions, the other sort of 35 monarchies, you know, in Japan, in, um, you know, most of them are in Europe. Um, and they're essentially powerless. I mean, and also, interesting, the economist in that 44 counted also Canada and Australia because they're still technically monarchies because they have the same British king, uh, British queen. And these folks are essentially powerless. They, they don't, they don't, they don't, they sort of have a ceremonial position. Um, in Britain, actually, it's because there is no written constitution, it's, it's, it can be a little, a little weird sometimes, but, but it hasn't been for quite some time. I mean, these are, these are, um, monarchs just aren't important as important as they are in the Middle East, anywhere else. And that's kind of, that's kind of crazy. Um, and um, I think we should probably pay a little more attention to how weird that is and question why that might be. Um, because it's actually, um, it's not a secret. Um, it's not a, it's not some kind of shock why this happened. Um, in the 1920s, uh, the Middle East uh, and uh, North Africa to a degree, um, less so because North Africa had already been carved off by uh, sort of European imperialists. Um, but in the, in the sort of 19 teens, in the aftermath of World War I, um, 
the Middle East, you know, from Egypt up into Syria and, and all the countries in between and down, down the Arabian Peninsula was in an extraordinary, had an extraordinary opportunity. This was the moment of liberation. For 500 years, the Ottomans had controlled, sorry, for 400 years, the Ottomans had controlled the entire region and the Ottomans had lost uh, World War I, so they lost it, they lost all of it. And this was this was the opportunity. This was the this was that moment um, like uh, Asia and Africa had in the 1950s. Those big independence moments, like uh, really Latin America sort of had in the 1820s, or Europe had in the 18 uh, 1850s, 1860s. You know, after 1848. Like, I mean, this was the moment. This was this was um, the Arab world's time to to shine and to and to you know flourish independently or what have you. And it just didn't happen. And it didn't happen um, not because Arabs are dumber or because Arabs weren't ready for democracy or Arabs weren't ready for this, that, and the other thing. It didn't happen because of a very, very concerted effort by European imperialists to keep it from happening, to keep the Arab, you know, Middle East, North Africa from flourishing with independence, democracy, um, you know, becoming real flourishing countries. This was, this was actively stopped. And their instrument, their main instrument in stopping this was Saudi Arabia. Um, I don't know if you've ever seen uh, Lawrence of Arabia. It's a classic, classic film. Um, and obviously based on all kinds of ridiculous stereotypes and, you know, pretending like this British guy was like the main thing in Arab liberation. But uh, what's interesting is there's in that film and in the whole, you know, Lawrence uh, mythology, there's... Um, there's there's the the Arabs that he partners with, and those were the Hashemites. Um, they were the folks who traditionally controlled uh, Mecca and Medina. Um, they were uh, had some real legitimacy. I mean, it's hard to say to, to what degree, but there was a real potential there for them to unite the Arab world. I mean, they were the folks who helped kick out um, the Ottomans. I mean, they were the they were sort of the 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 bearer of uh, many nationalist hopes for Arabs. And um, the British, after partnering with them and using them, um, realized, holy crap, like, you know, this guy Faisal seems to be fairly well liked. And, you know, he went to the, uh, I think he went to the peace conference in Versailles and like made a really good impression. And, you know, he's both got some legitimacy because he's, you know, his family controls these holy places. And, He's also pretty urbane and, you know, can, can, can cut a good figure in Paris and, you know, maybe, maybe they don't love him in the cities, but they don't mind him so much. Holy crap, this Faisal guy we set up could actually, like, you know, create an Arab super state that's, like, powerful and, and would kick us out. And that's not what the French and the British wanted. The French and the British wanted um, their slices of the Middle East, and they got their slices of the Middle East, uh, despite the fact they couldn't really afford them, couldn't really... Um, you know, keep them together. And, uh, you know, they did find a bit for um, uh, that King, I think King Faisal, was it actually King Faisal or one of his family members who got to be the King of Iraq? Um, and uh, other members of his family got to be the Kings of Jordan. But this was after the British had funded the destruction of their legitimacy and power. And their instrument was Saudi Arabia. The Saudi Arabians like to talk about, you know, they have this august history going back to <clears throat> the time of the Umayyads, which is hogwash. Um, you know, there are, you know, the actual families that rule Saudi Arabia today do go back to sort of the 1700s, but they were, they were freaks. They were, uh, they were super extreme um, back in the 1700s. They were super extreme back in the 1800s. They were far outside of the mainstream of Islamic practice. And whenever they, you know, got a fanatics army together, sorry, we're clearly having some trouble here. Um, I hope you can hear me over the sirens. But whenever they got a fanatics army together to um, uh, take over some territory, they'd hold it for a decade or so, and then all of the other Muslim powers would kick them out. This happened, I think, two times in the 19th century. So at the beginning of the 20th century, at the beginning of the 1900s, um, the Saudis were just some exile family in Kuwait, and it was the British that built them back up. Um, the, the, the Saudis took subsidies from the British government uh, all the way up until the 1930s when the oil money started, late 1930s when the oil money started. 
um, they used surplus World War I guns from the British to take most of modern Saudi Arabia. It was between 1924 and 1925 um, when they kicked the Hashemites, when they kicked the, 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 the more attractive and interesting British allies out of the two holy cities. Um, they, have, they have held the two holy cities for less than a century. Um, and they kicked out the people who'd been there for 500 years. Um, so, so that was, you know, the Saudis were very a very effective tool from the beginning. That was what they were designed to do, was to crush a more plausible, uh, independent Arab and, and unified Arab state. That was their purpose. Um, and that's, that's sort of interesting because, you know, the Arabs have been fooled. Uh, the, you know, uh, U.S. President Woodrow Wilson had sort of, joined World War I with the idea that, you know, it was going to be all about independence, this, that, and the other thing. And um, instead, the French and the British got big slices of the Middle East. Um, and they, of course, had to call them something different. They had to call them mandates. They weren't, you know, colonies anymore because, you know, the Americans wouldn't have put up with that. But they were mandates. We're just here to help or, or what have you. Um, so basically, uh, you know, the Arabs were screwed. And the, the instrument of their screwing was Saudi Arabia. Um, and I think that's, that's a key thing to remember. So it was, it was setting up this very extreme version of monarchy that sort of crushed the initial flourishing of um, national unity and, and, and uh, forward motion in the Arab world in the 1920s. I mean, that's what it did first. Um, after World War I, sorry, after World War II, um, the British had to begin fading back. Uh, specifically, uh, I mean, they actually, I was just reading an article on the London Review of Books, it's something about the Gulf Conundrum or something like that, and it had made the point that before 1968, 69, 70, the British actually poured more resources into the Middle East than they'd ever had before, because they've been kicked out of India, they've been kicked out of a range of other places. Uh, so it was sort of maintaining power in the Middle East was sort of their last gasp. So they actually had, had played more of a role in propping up the Saudis and the rest of the, the Emirates, uh, all those weird little monarchies uh, for a longer period of time than I'd initially um, uh, realized. But the U.S. was also in there at the same time. So it was sort of, you know, British helping run things with American money, American folks putting in their own spin on things. So it was, you know, from, the, from, the, from that famous first meeting, I think in 1945 between uh, Ibn Saud, the founder of modern Saudi Arabia. Um, that's 1932, by the way, that you know, the modern kingdom of Saudi Arabia was sort of founded. Um, and then 1945, you've got FDR and the founder of modern Saudi Arabia um, meeting. Um, from 1945 to 1971, 1972, it was sort of British and the U.S. together propping up Saudi Arabia. And what's interesting about that, that period of time is... Um, I think into the, uh, I think we're all pretty familiar, if you're a viewer of this, this film, uh, of this channel, um, with how, uh, you know, sort of the experience from like 1979 when the Grand Mosque in Mecca was sort of taken over by extremists and then you know, Saudi Arabia decided to get involved in um, Afghanistan and how that gave birth to Al Qaeda, you know, and you're fairly familiar with that. But this period between World War II and before that is also kind of interesting because while there was a lot of funding of religious extremism, that wasn't really the main focus. The main focus for Saudi Arabia and also for the United States and the British was countering Arab nationalism. Um, it's, it's, I talked about this a bit in uh, the Algeria video last week, but there's just, a, there's just the barest remnants of it left, sort of the tatters of it. But in the 50s, 60s, it really looked like the Arab world was going to bounce back from the way it had been ripped apart by the Saudis uh, and the British uh, after World War One. They were going to, you know, they were going to unify. Um, you know, Gaddafi uh, put forward some uh, some plots to unify the Arab world, and uh, Nasser, uh, Gamal Abdel Nasser, uh, president of Egypt, uh, the one that finally kicked the British out of Egypt. Um, he. Uh, he also, you know, put forward this, this, this program of Arab nationalism. And uh, at one point, he actually managed to put together a United Arab Republic. You know, Egypt and Syria joined together. And this was terrifying, terrifying uh, to uh, Britain and the United States, because if all of these, you know, places unified, 
then, you know, all these little tiny rinky dink kingdoms with all of the oil and gas uh, wealth um, were going to probably get swallowed pretty quickly. Um, so once again, the instrument for destroying Nasser, I mean, I don't want to romanticize Nasser. Uh, he screwed up a lot of things as well. You know, when he put together the United Arab Republic between Egypt and Syria, I mean, Syria, the folks running Syria were like, wait a second, I think it really only took three years before they were like, screw this, because Syria was being, um, uh, Syria was being um, taken advantage of and exploited by Egypt and Nasser. So, I mean, you know, it's not only Saudi Arabia, but Saudi Arabia was the main instrument. Um, the thing that killed Nasser, um, I think, you know, I guess he died in power in the early 70s, or was it was late 60s. But um, one of the big things, uh, big Arab nationalist things was we're gonna beat Israel. We're gonna kick, we're gonna kick Israel out of the region. Um, and uh, one of the things that sort of cut him out of the knees was uh, losing, uh, I think 1967, that's the Six Day War, right? Losing the Six Day War against the Israelis. But the reason that happened, or one of the reasons that that happened uh, um, was uh, the fact that the Egyptian army, when that war happened, was already tied up in a conflict that's known as uh, Egypt's Vietnam, or Nasser's Vietnam, which was a conflict in Yemen. And it was the Saudis who were funding uh, the Zaydi Shia um, uh, rulers in what is, I think it's sometimes known as the North Yemen Civil War. But regardless, there were tens of thousands of Egyptian troops fighting and dying in that conflict um, while the Six Day, you know, when the Six Day War happened. So it was actually the Saudis, uh, not the Israelis, who had sort of done the, the real work in destroying Nasser and destroying that new flourishing of Arab nationalism. So it, it's quite, uh, I mean, it, it's quite, quite extraordinary just how throughout Saudi Arabia's period in power, Throughout Saudi Arabia's existence, it has had this really, um, well, I guess, you know, from uh, you know, a pro-Israel American perspective, not the worst, but, uh, um, you know, it's had a really malign effect on Middle Eastern politics. It has functioned to keep the Arab world backwards, to keep them um, uh, sort of failing. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it's, quite, it's quite sobering to sort of look at the way that... <laughs> That, this, that Saudi Arabia has existed for so long. Um, and then, of course, we get into the era that I've you know, covered a lot, uh, the funding of religious extremism, the creation of radical Islamic terrorism, this and anything. But also, it, at, the, at the same time, this, this sort of policy of propping up other monarchies and um, crushing any attempt at secular governance, uh, sorry, any attempt at democratic governance, has been has been a continued has been a continued theme. Um, what's interesting about sort of the post Arab Spring, where in most cases um, Saudi Arabia acted to prop up the um, the strongman. Uh, in Syria, they acted to uh, to try to get rid of of Assad. I mean, heavily acted to try to get rid of Assad. And what's interesting about that is it's. Uh, it's the fact that uh, Assad still uh, was a Baathist. And the Baath ideology, I mean, I, think I could be wrong about this, but I'm pretty sure so those were the folks who agreed to join with Nasser in the United Arab Republic. Um, uh, Saddam, Saddam Hussein, the other great enemy of, um, of Saudi Arabia, uh, was also, I mean, yeah, obviously he was no Democrat, nor, nor were the, was the Assad regime, but these folks were secular. These folks were nationalists. These folks were modernizers. Their idea was that they were going to lift the, lift the, um, you know, lift the region up and move forward. And of course, they, they ended up as sort of beaten up, uh, crappy uh, dictatorships. But that's you, we have to realize that you know Saudi Arabia was pouring billions of dollars every year into turning them into beat up, crappy dictatorships. So rather than where everywhere else, um, Saudi Arabia wanted to prop up the dictator in the region. In Syria, they were against him because still uh, the Assad uh, regime uh, still you know, barely pushes this Arab nationalist, unifying, modernizing Ba'ath ideology. And that's something that Saudi Arabia has always been opposed to. So that, that was always something that was going on 
in the background of this sort of flashier, more obvious, and more superficially damaging um, Arab radical, uh, sorry, uh, Muslim radicalism uh, that Saudi Arabia was pushing. But, you know, of course, they both work together. Um, if you, uh, the sort of, there's a whole branch of uh, Salafism. I don't like getting too, too deep into uh, sort of uh, religious uh, taxonomy here, but my understanding is there are many branches of Salafism. You know, Salafism is sort of the, the sort of, uh, Salafism is a type of Wahhabism or rather Wahhabism is a type of Salafism. I, like I said, I don't want to go into too much detail here, but um, not what I'm up on this month. Uh, but Salafism does have branches. Uh, you know, some of it can go off into jihadism, sort of ISIS, Al Qaeda type ideologies. But there's also a quietist branch branch to it, so sort of a pacifist. Um, you know, the government's going to do what the government's going to do. What matters is my relationship with Allah and the Prophet. This sort of the other thing. So that, I mean, that too. That that's a real trend that has been fostered in. The Middle East um, by Saudi Arabia, which is just sort of like, ah, who cares who's the government? You know, that's not what real Muslims should care about. Um, if it's a dictatorship, it's a dictatorship. Let's just sort of keep on going. I mean, that's another aspect of what Saudi Arabia has been pushing. Um, and that obviously uh, uh, leads to countries where things don't get better. Um, so uh, it's, I think that's, that was something that really struck me as I was preparing for this, that there was this incredible revolutionary potential, this great moment the Arab world a century ago, like like almost a hundred years ago now. And Saudi Arabia has been instrumental in crushing it for its entire existence. Um, so that was, that was striking. Um, and then we get to the Arab Spring where this came to the fore again. Um, just to, I mean, go through the list. I mean, Bahrain had, uh, I'm sure I mispronounced it, Bahrain, I don't know. I, um, had uh, one of the more effective and uh, complete uh, uh, sort of Arab Spring movements, you know, the, the, the leaders of Bahrain didn't have much uh, legitimacy and they were about to get kicked out. So Saudi Arabia and the UAE literally rolled tanks into Bahrain and made sure that didn't happen and propped up the, the monarch. Um, Jordan, I'm pretty sure, I remember this, I was looking for it briefly last night and didn't find, but I'm pretty sure that Jordan and I know Morocco got huge subsidies from Saudi Arabia during the Arab Spring. So Morocco and Jordan are both monarchies. Um, and they got huge subsidies from Saudi Arabia during the Arab Spring so that they could bribe their populace the way that Saudi Arabia could. Um, so when people say that the Arab Spring failed or the Arab Spring you know, screwed up or, or this, that, the other thing, um, I think people should recognize more that Saudi Arabia was there actively crushing the Arab Spring. I mean, that was the whole point of their, their involvement. It was a very clear sort of reactionary war against the idea of people-led governments in uh, the Middle East and North Africa. Uh, I mean, it's, 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 it's quite clear. And I mean, this is coming up again, um, as we see in uh, Sudan and in Algeria. I don't think there's been any direct offers so far in Algeria, but in Sudan, it's, it's been quite clear after uh, Omar al-Bashir fell, um, the uh, this is the dictator of Sudan since I want to say 1989. Um, he fell, um, uh, but the military uh, regime that he ran is still in power, and the military regime and the protesters are sort of bargaining back and forth. And the protesters want the military regime gone as well. So last week, or was it the week before, Saudi Arabia gave the military regime three billion dollars uh, to 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 play with. You know, just stay in power. You can do it. Um, Libya is another example. I did a video uh, on Haftar in Libya uh, a couple of weeks back, and uh, this is a guy who, before he uh, decided to attack the UN-supported government in Tripoli, he visited Saudi Arabia, got their approval and their funding. Um, it's it's not it's not subtle what's going on here. Uh, Saudi Arabia is the main reason uh, that Middle East North Africa is a mess. I think that, I mean, maybe the main reason is overstating it, but it's a very significant strand and it's one that we just don't talk about. Um, and I think that's, I think probably the main reason that the Middle East, North Africa is still such a mess is this, um, is that Cold War never ended there. It's because there's all these regional powers that still think it's okay uh, to fund the proxies and screw things up in the Middle East.
place. That's the main reason. Um, and of course, you know, the influence of Israel and the influence of Saudi Arabia both feed into that main reason. Um, but while I think uh, the negative influence of Israel in the Middle East is very well known and very focused on, I don't think people focus to the degree that they should on the fact that there's Saudi Arabia and also the United Arab Emirates is a very enthusiastic junior partner, more competent junior partner than Saudi Arabia. These countries together are a reactionary, anti-democratic, um, anti-development, really, anti-modernization force in the Middle East and North Africa. And uh, it's a tremendous stumbling block for the region. Um, so yeah, I think that's the presentation uh, that I have. That's, uh, that's what I wanted to uh, get out uh, today in 40 minutes, less than an hour. I'm, I'm doing well. I am doing well. Um, have we got questions? Um, I think it's time to start the uh, Q&A period of, uh, of the presentation. Uh, so I guess gosh, we'll be doing that for an hour and 20 minutes if you're up for it. So question, questions. Do we have questions? Um, do we have questions? Were there any super, oh, there was a super chat. Okay, Mr. Methuselah. Oh, thank you. Mr. Methuselah gave me $5. I'm very grateful, Mr. Methuselah. Uh, that, of course, makes me want to uh, answer your questions, Mr. Methuselah, but I don't see any. Is there another one up there? Oh, uh, thank you, uh, Farouk Abdinov. Farouk Abdinov, that's, a, that's an awesome name. Sort of Russian, is that a, Azerbaijani? I don't know, that's pretty cool. Um, but I do not see questions associated with these super chats. Uh, but obviously, if uh, Farouk Abdinov or Mr. Methuselah has a question, I will instantly want to answer that. Okay, Thomas Cromwell asks, do the Saudis under MBS still support terrorism like they did in the 80s and 90s? Is his secular image a flaw? That's a really interesting question, and it's something that I also wonder about a lot. Um, in Saudi Arabia proper, there are very serious reforms being made. Of course, this is also um, paired with a clamping down and a really extreme, I mean, it was a couple of weeks back, they executed a bunch of Shia, um, so obviously the fact that they're executing mostly Shia as terrorists should indicate that, you know, they haven't really moved to being, uh, you know, anti-sectarianism, uh, but within Saudi Arabia itself, there have been meaningful reforms under King Salman and under MBS, because they recognize to make any of their sort of fantastical uh, claims about Vision 2030 or diversification of business, they have to uh, lean back on repression within Saudi Arabia itself. As to whether that's really changed things abroad, I haven't seen any convincing evidence saying that it has, frankly. Um, I think that uh, the, what the Saudi-sponsored preachers are saying in mosques from Belgium to Nigeria to you know across the world, the, the Muslim world, has that changed significantly? I would be surprised. Uh, I haven't seen, but I haven't seen much data on that one way or the other. I think we have to concede that there has been meaningful change within Saudi Arabia itself, though coupled with even more extreme repression. Um, whether or not that's actually uh, filtered out to the you know, billions of dollars of uh, charity uh, that Saudi Arabia does every year is, is uh, undetermined. Um, it's hard to say. We just don't know. Um, also, I mean, an aspect of the war in Yemen, which is now uh, uh, now the UN now now states has killed uh, 230,000 people, a quarter of a million people. Um, the underpinning of that is uh, Saudi um, force trying to force Wahhabism onto a country that is traditionally Zaidi Shia. Now, uh, to be clear, Zaidi Shia is very different from the version of uh, Shia faith practiced in Iran. So like the idea that they're closely tied is a myth that the Saudis push, but the Saudis created the Houthi movement by forcing Wahhabism down the throats of people who just simply did not want it. Um, so while, yeah, it's possible that um, there's now some backing off on what radical preachers say um, in Saudi-funded mosques around the world, it's kind of hard for me to celebrate, um, you know, any kind of shift there. While 
Saudi Arabia is still actively attempting to conquer a country because they disagree with the faith that's practiced there and they disagree with the attempts to set up a better form of government. So yeah, that was that question. Um, do, do, do. Uh, James Cook asks, uh, at MFF, was Turkey number three in democracy slash secularism after Lebanon and Tunisia? Why did the US sponsor a coup there? Um, so that's interesting. You know, Is Turkey part of the Middle East is um, an interesting question. I would sort of, and sometimes it is, and actually, actually I think I'm inconsistent on that as well. Um, but I don't see Turkey as, uh, as far as, Turkey as a functioning democracy, I would actually put it far beyond both Lebanon and Tunisia, um, even today, far beyond Lebanon and Tunisia. And the day before yesterday, I'd have been happier saying that. Um, the, uh, I mean, Turkey is not an Arab country, uh, which I think should, uh, most of you are well aware of. Uh, it is a different, Turkey was not a colonialized country. It was not a country that was a victim of imperialism, really. I mean, there was an attempt uh, after the fall of the Ottoman Empire. Okay, so that, the Ottoman Empire, so was Turkey a victim of imperialism? That's an interesting question, um, because I think it was a participant in imperialism. It was as imperialist as it was imperialized, if that makes sense. And it was losing for a while. Um, and that, you know, so the fact that it was losing to Russia, losing to Britain, losing to France, you could plausibly call that a victim of imperialism for that. But anyway, Turkey is just a tremendously different country. And I wasn't really including Turkey in the analysis that I was doing today. I don't consider it as part of sort of basically I wanted to talk about the Arab world. And because people were so jumping down my throat about uh, Berbers in the last thing, I was being Middle East, North Africa, Middle East, North Africa, but I am talking about sort of um, countries that have a very high degree of Arabic cultural influence, uh, if you will. And Turkey, I do not count among them. I consider Turkey to be a much bigger, uh, um, uh, a much more consolidated democracy than Lebanon for sure, and even Tunisia actually, um, even with, um, uh, Erdogan's attempt to, uh, well, uh, I guess Erdogan's attempt to steal the local elections in Istanbul recently. Um, they do have votes that are mostly free and fair. They do have uh, changes in power um, between parties. Um, you know, in Tunisia, they have peaceful transitions of power between individuals, but there's also, I mean, there's a lot of, um, uh, how do I put this? Um, it's a small place and it's very vulnerable to what the Europeans want. It's very vulnerable to what the Americans want. Uh, so I don't know if it's as, um, even the fact that Erdogan is present in Turkey because Turkey is powerful enough and independent enough to have an Erdogan, um, I think is something that makes it more democratic than Tunisia, even though the effects of Erdogan's presidency are now quite malign. Um, and he is definitely becoming a dictator. I see Turkey as a democracy that is fading, whereas uh, Lebanon and Tunisia are democracies that um, have yet to really fully reach um, their full fruition. Though I am a huge fan of Tunisia, and I think it's making immense progress. Uh, Thomas Cromwell asks, uh, what is your view on the Kurds? Should they get independence, including Rojava and Syria, PKK in Turkey and Iraqi Kurdistan? Uh, no, I am not a big fan of Kurdish independence. Um, I like uh, Iraqi Kurdistan. I think it should be able to preserve its privileges. Um, I could plausibly be open to the idea of, um, I would like Rojava and Syria to preserve its privileges, but I redrawing maps is always a bad idea. Um, it always leads to extraordinary conflict. One of the greatest shames, uh, and I would, uh, as you know, someone who's a big fan of Turkey and lived in Istanbul for a number of years, I would be very strongly opposed uh, to any um, carving off any part of Turkey uh, to create a new Kurdistan. One of the great tragedies uh, of um, Erdogan's late governance uh, since 2015 specifically is that prior to 2015, he was actually pretty great on the Kurdish issue. I mean, you know, one of the, I think the biggest the highest population Kurdish city in the world is Istanbul. 
Um, and the Kurds are sure as fuck not getting Istanbul um, for an independent state. Uh, they had finally, after incredible bad blood and slaughter for decades, um, they had uh, really, um, uh, they had really made extraordinary strides. This is the Turkish government towards resolving the, the Turkish Kurd issue uh, with everybody getting rich and everybody getting happier. Um, and the war in Syria specifically, I think, derailed that. Um, the U.S. created war in Syria, derailed that. So to be like, oh, well, okay, throw up our hands. Let's carve up uh, these countries that have existed for a century. I don't, I don't, I'm not a big fan of that. And I understand that the Kurds uh, capture a lot of people's um, affections and, the, you know, my affections to a degree. I obviously want them to have flourishing, you know, national freedom and stuff and everything. But, uh, you know, no, this idea like, oh, okay, you know, they helped us solve one of the problems we created um, with ISIS. Uh, so now they should get their own state um, and fuck Turkey, who's been our ally for 70 years. No, I don't. I'm not a fan of that, um, which I know uh, bugs some folks. Um, Rahula asks, who is really funding and supporting the Taliban? I don't know much about Afghanistan. I'll be honest. Uh, I know that uh, there's some really screwed up. Uh, rumors that places like The Economist will uh, will endorse saying that the Russians are supporting the Taliban. And like the, the Economist just straight up said that in an article once. And I was like, what? Um, so I looked into it a little more. And yeah, nobody in the U.S. government is willing to claim that. And if nobody in the U.S. You know, said, basically called that a crazy, unsubstantiated rumor, like if the U.S. government is saying that uh, it's a crazy, unsubstantiated rumor. Um, then why is the Economist saying that the Russians are supporting the Taliban in Afghanistan? I think that's honestly just kind of a part of the that rumor is part of sort of the insane threat inflation of Russia. Um, the United States is tremendously invested in this idea that, uh, especially over the past year, that great power competition is like a new thing now, and it's absurd because, I mean, the Russians are barely keeping it together. The Chinese are a couple decades from, you know, even being able to take Taiwan back, um, which is what, like 100 miles from there, from their border. Um, so yeah, this who's really funding the Taliban, I would, I mean, who knows? I mean, I, my understanding is uh, it's well acknowledged that they make a lot of money off of selling opium. Um, that makes sense. Um, also, uh, you know, the Afghan people who fucking hate invaders like the United States. So yeah, I, uh, I look at our uh, presence in uh, the United States pretty as pretty dumb. Uh, sorry, the US presence in Afghanistan as pretty dumb and the Taliban, obviously not a big fan, um, but uh, quite literally all the people who supported Osama bin Laden on 9-11 are dead. Um, not all of them, most of them. Um, because the war in Afghanistan has been going on so long that a generation of leadership has passed. Uh, I mean, Mullah Omar is dead. Osama bin Laden is dead. Um, if the Taliban wants Afghanistan, leave it to them. That's what I think. Um, Muhammad al Shamiz asks, oh, sorry, Mr. Methuselah, who uh, gave me a super chat, gave me five bucks, very grateful, so I have to answer his question. I have to answer everybody's questions, but you know, I really have to answer his um, Mr. Methuselah asks, Rob, what do you think about Erdogan nullifying the election for the Istanbul representative? I hate it. Uh, I think it's, it really, really pisses me off. Um, it's, uh, I have been very clear, um, since 2013, since Gezi, I have been very clearly anti-Erdogan, uh, but always with the acknowledgement that actually Erdogan did some things very well uh, for his country. Um, but it's time for him to go. Uh, it's kind of like Putin, you know, like Putin, you know, it was Putin's first decade. He really sort of put things together and, you know, helped rebuild uh, Russia after a really chaotic and nasty 90s. Um, I think Erdogan uh, definitely, you know, brought a little more respect for Islam, which is what most of the Turkish people wanted and was a good economic steward. Uh, but certainly since 2013, probably for a number of years before that, Erdogan should go. But also Erdogan keeps winning because, you know, he keeps winning elections. Um, this step here is a much more important step towards dictatorship uh, than I think it's. It's interesting because people have been, um, oh, wow, 
I'm not even sure what TK Kara, but thank you, Fatah al Um I will get to that in a second. Um, but um, the US and the EU has been crying wolf on Erdogan's dictatorship for so long that I think people aren't, um, uh, aren't recognizing what a drastic and shitty move this is, uh, stealing the local election. Um, that you know, we've been calling him a dictator for decades, you know, since basically since 2013 now. Um, so this truly dictatorial, this truly anti-democratic action isn't getting the play that it should. I mean, it was on the top of the BBC uh, news site this morning, but I mean, the BBC news has been calling Erdogan a dictator forever. This move in particular, stealing an election, that's not something the AK party had to do before because the AK party would consistently win elections. I mean, in 2015, I would argue that they used political manipulation to essentially rerun an election, but that was the ballot box in Turkey was to a degree that was fiddling around, but was to a degree somewhat sacrosanct. You know, it was, it was something that they took seriously. Um, Turkish democracy was something that was taken seriously. Um, this move here is dictatorship. Uh, this is a real problem, and I hope I hope they rerun that election and uh, um, Imam Olu. I really have to learn how to Ekrem Imam Manolu. And uh, the uh, the opposition candidate for mayor in Istanbul crushes him. I hope absolutely crushes the AK party. Um, I would hope that even uh, Turkish people who are big supporters of Erdogan won't let this stand because that is this is the real this is the real move towards dictatorship. This is the real crushing of Turkish democracy. So yeah, I do take that very seriously. It pisses me off a lot. Um, Thank you, uh, Fatal Goeda. Uh, that is 20, what are DKK? I don't know what DKK is. But uh, thank you, Fatal uh, Goeda. Um, is there a way that MBS can improve his reputation? Um, it's an interesting, well, I mean, there's so many ways. I mean, it, it's, it's extraordinary because, I mean, he's got all of the, um, he has got, all, as I was talking about, I mean, Saudi Arabia, the United States, um, Britain, I mean, it's not like that interest has really faded. Um, for the U.S. people, you know, people in the United States who, um, I mean, so there's some arguments that's fading, but, you know, for me anyway, I love democracy. I love uh, systems that are representative of what the people want. Pe people want, I have this sense of sort of progress towards democracy and prosperity. It's something that I want. That's still not something that the U.S. government or the British government wants. What they want is control uh, of the Middle East and control of the Middle East oil resources. This isn't even, uh, there's a great article in the London Review of Books. I should, I just read it last night. It's fantastic. Sort of pointing out that um, even now with the U.S. having all the shale stuff, um, it's not about um, getting oil for the United States, it's about controlling the oil that goes to China, India, and Europe. Um, so it's, it's power. And Saudi Arabia's incredible weakness gives power to the United States. So all MBS has to do to have the entire power of the US government behind him um, is stop doing stupid shit. Um, stop killing people. Stop uh, decapitating dozens of, uh, and I understand that, you know, maybe decapitating uh, a bunch of people uh, for, for writing pro-democracy blog posts. I um, mean, of course, I can't remember, it was like 40 people that were, that were killed in a mass execution a couple of weeks back. Some of them are absolutely massive al-Qaeda terrorists and like totally, I mean, I don't, I'm not a fan of the death penalty, but like should have been killed. But also interspersed with them were Shia people who wanted to, you know, just a little more respect for Shia, in, for the Shia faith in Saudi Arabia, or um, literally like teenagers who had blogs that were pro-democracy. So, you know, he needs to stop doing shit like that. He needs to stop murdering people who um, uh, uh, are against his regime. Um, if he didn't do, he needs to stop um, attacking uh, UN governments in Libya. If he just stopped doing egregiously insane shit, he's got, you know, he's still got um, billions of dollars that he can put towards public relations. 
he's still got, I mean, it's even after all the evil shit that he's done, um, uh, the U S Congress, Democrats and Republicans is, is really, really leery of doing anything to, um, uh, to really undercut what he does. I mean, yeah, they had the, the war powers resolution that was passed, but they couldn't beat uh, Trump's veto. Um, so even after everything that he's done, MBS still has significant support in the U.S. Congress and the U.S. government beyond the, the Trump administration that he's bought. So honestly, the, if MBS wants to improve his reputation, he's just got to stop doing crazy stuff. Um, he's got to actually focus on, you know, building some business and diversification in Saudi Arabia instead of these weird um, ways that, yeah, just MBS to improve his reputation should just stop doing stupid things. Um, ah, okay. Mr. Muthuza points out that DKK equals Danish krona. So thank you, Padel Guerrero, for 20 Danish krona. Um, okay. Oh, questions, 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 questions. Um, Thomas Cromwell asks, at Motor More Freedom Foundation, the Clinton administration spent millions of dollars to support Turkey, repressing the PKK in the 90s, so it's inaccurate to say that we are trying to screw Turkey by supporting them? Well, I, I'm not entirely sure I understand the critique, um, because, yes, we are screwing Turkey by supporting them. Uh, like, if... Uh, yeah, if, uh, if Russia, say, supported our war against the Taliban, you know, throughout the 2000s and then switched to supporting the Taliban against us, they would be screwing us. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't quite understand the question. Yes, we absolutely helped Turkey repress the PKK. I believe PKK is still technically on the, the list of terrorist organizations for the U.S., um, so, yeah, but the fact that we have set up a, um, set up a, 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 a Syrian Kurdistan, uh, Rojava, um, absolutely screws Turkey. Um, I think that's quite straightforward. And if Turkey had somebody um, advocating for their interests who didn't seem to be auditioning to be the next Saddam Hussein, then it would be much more obvious. Uh, Rahula asks, who was behind the Turkey coup? Um, I believe it was the Gulenists were behind the Turkey coup. I think that's fairly well established. Um, I think that the United States was shamefully late and unenthusiastic about defending Erdogan's government, um, which I think uh, Erdogan and the Turkish people have a right to be angry about. Um, but this idea that um, uh, the U.S. supported the coup against Turkey, I don't, I don't buy it. I've seen no proof of it. Um, I just see... Uh, People making the argument because it's uh, politically useful, but I don't. I, I still don't buy it. I know a ton of journalists, both Turkish and uh, you know Westerners in Turkey. Nobody saw any real support for that. So yeah, I don't. I don't think that's. I don't think the U.S. really supported the Turkey coup. Um, also, you could also have been asking, did Erdogan, um, you know, create the coup? I don't think that's true either. Um, I think what I think is possible is that uh, Erdogan saw the coup coming and, uh, you know, could have acted earlier to stop it, but let it happen uh, because it uh, would provide a lot of political uh, oomph to him. Um, that's possible. I'm not saying that's what happened. I think it's a possibility that I could imagine, but there's no real proof of that either way. So yeah, I mean, who knows? Maybe 50 years from now, um, they'll open some box or some, you know, some files will come to light that were like, oh yeah, the CIA totes uh, worked with Gulen to bring that coup about, but I would be surprised. I think that would be kind of aggressively stupid. Um, and Turkey's reached a sort of different level of government. It's not like uh, a place like Libya or, um, uh, you know, some other place where we could just sort of glibly be like, oh, sure, let's let's coup the fuck out of it. Um, no, it's a top 20 economy. Like, it's a real place. Um, and I think, uh, uh, I'm sorry, every country in the world is a real place. Um, but it's got real economic significance and weight and sort of giving um, Turkey to the Gulenists, I don't think that would have been something that... Uh, uh, I don't think even Washington, D.C. is that stupid, um, but I could be wrong. Um, anyway, uh, that's who's behind the turkey coup in my take. Um, 
Oh, that's a really interesting question uh, from Barto Zarnata. I hope I pronounced that somewhat uh, appropriately. Uh, your take on the future of the British monarchy after Brexit. Um, I'm not, uh, I think it all depends on the personality of the monarch, obviously. Uh, Queen Elizabeth, uh, as long as she's around, um, she's, uh, you know, the monarchy is quite safe. Uh, she she went through her, her, her um, dark times in the 90s and you know came out came out fine uh i as you know someone with you know i'm, I'm torn i mean I, you know as a kid I, I could tell you every uh i could tell you every english i could name every english monarch from uh william the conqueror uh down to modern times uh so you know i have a very anglophile family but on the other hand i'm also kind of i'm quite uh republican not in the you know u.s political uh, sense, but I'm quite Republican in my leanings. I just find I have a visceral disgust for the idea of monarchs or aristocracy. I find the idea that anybody putting themselves above me or above other people, uh, I find it disgusting. Um, so I'm not a big fan of uh, monarchy myself, um, but uh, I really just watching the way that people react to news um, oh, the royal wedding and the royal baby and the royal this and the royal that. And uh, I think both of the, um, uh, uh, I think both of the, uh, the two uh, young royal kids have very savvily uh, found themselves quite, uh, uh, quite stunning partners and uh, have, have set up this kind of thing that uh, is going to keep celebrity media fed for decades. So I think the, I think the, the prospects for the British monarchy are pretty good um, unless, uh, you know, King Charles comes to the throne and is like, I don't know, like, let's kick out all the brown people or something. You know, it's interesting because with, as is always the case with monarchy, even with a powerless, powerless monarchy, as we have in Britain, it's completely dependent on um, the personality of the person who's in charge. And Queen Elizabeth is beloved. Uh, you know, Prince Charles less so. But honestly, you know, well, actually, with his genes, he could very well be around for another 30, 40 years. But he could also just be around for five to ten. And it sounds like, uh, you know, five to ten after his mother finally dies. And it seems like what are, what are they? William and Harry, those those folks, um, seem to have done a very good job of, uh, you know, when they're not going to Halloween parties in Nazi uniforms, um, you know, seem to have done a fairly good job of not offending anybody yet so yeah it just depends on the personality of the monarchs um let's see questions 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 <laughs> okay that is not a what's the point dude it's not a question for me um uh more freedom thomas cromwell asks do you think turkey's treatment of the kurds is comparable to israel's treatment of the palestinians um, yes, absolutely. Um, and I think that that was, that was, has historically been a, a real bridge, uh, between, um, Turkey and Israel, um, is the fact that they both had these minorities that they wanted to oppress. However, um, I think that the Kur, the Turks have actually dramatically, um, I think in the nineties, you could certainly say, oh yeah, it's very similar. But now um, the Turks have made, uh, despite the war against the PKK, have actually become uh, dramatically more um, welcoming and have, have turned towards policies that are much better for the Kurds than and Israelis have actually turned. I don't know if they've turned further against the Palestinians, but it hasn't improved at all. Whereas if uh, you know a person can happily self-identify as a Kurd, well, well I mean, legally anyway, um, but can, you know, be of Kurdish descent, go to Istanbul, make millions of dollars, be a significant um, a player in the AK party, probably the GHP party, definitely not the MHP party, but, you know, a, a Kurd in Turkey, as long as they renounce radical politics or renounce the idea of independence, can be a very, you know, can move to the top of Turkish society. Uh, I don't know how often that happens, but, you know, it, it, it's plausible. Um, a Palestinian in Israel or even an Israeli Arab in Israel uh, that has the vote and everything is still very much a second-class citizen. 
Um, and, you know, there's nothing, no amount of, um, I guess, you know, if they, maybe if they converted to Judaism, but even, you know, the, the, uh, pe the people of color Jews in Israel also face a lot of, um, a lot of racism. So, uh, yeah, I think Turkey's treatment of the Kurds historically was similar to Israel's treatment of the Palestinians, um, but actually now it's much better. Um, than the way the Israelis treat the Palestinians. Um, okay. Ste Stefan asks, can Brazil become a great power? Uh, I'm going to do it. I'm going to deploy one of the cruelest uh, uh, sayings about Brazil. I think some of you already know this. It's, Brazil is the country of the future, and it always will be, um, which is, I think, unfair. Um, I think Brazil has tremendous potential, um, as it always has. Um, and I think, I mean, Brazil, before it can do anything, um, needs to uh, so sort out its political system. It's hopelessly corrupt. Um, it, it's just, uh, there was a great, uh, what's his name? God, there's this famous sort of socialist historian who, uh, God, what's his name? did this really amazing long read on um, just Brazilian politics. And even though he's a very socialist guy, he just, I mean, he just trashes everybody from Lula to, uh, uh, I mean, he likes Lula and he likes Dilma. Actually, he likes Dilma better than he likes Lula. Um, because Dilma actually seems to have been one of the least corrupt politicians in, uh, you know, modern Brazilian political history, which is why she got impeached. Um, but, uh, Anyway, it's just it's just such a mess, and it, what's really been hilarious is watching sort of traditional, more right-leaning, you know, pro-capitalist whatever publications like The Economist uh, be like, oh, you know, Bolsonaro, he's not such a fascist, you know, he's you know he's okay because you know he'll presumably do things that are good for um, uh, good for the U.S., good for international business. And watching them sort of fall off and be like, oh, my God, this guy's an incredible clown. Um, because, yeah, it, it's Brazil is insanely dysfunctional. And I think a lot has to do with, like, deep-seated corruption, um, which is such a shame because I think it's Sergio Moro was the guy, the prosecutor, who was uh, trying to go after corruption. And the problem is that my understanding, I, I haven't done a deep study on Brazil, so take this with a grain of salt, but my understanding with Brazil is that it's so corrupt that even the anti-corruption efforts uh, end up being, um, there's so much for them to start at that whoever they pick, you know, the people they pick to prosecute make it a partisan uh, operation automatically. Because to even function, to get to the point where you're elected to the Brazilian legislature and are a, um, a factor in Brazilian politics, you have to be corrupt. Um, so, whereas I think this guy, Sergio Moro, I think is his name, the, the, the Lovato, uh, the car wash uh, prosecutions, now, you know, everyone was like, oh, he's amazing, and uh, because it's finally somebody's going after Brazilian corruption, but now he's in Bolsonaro's cabinet. So everyone's like, oh, wait, oh, I guess that was just another partisan exercise, even though the, prosecu the corruption he was prosecuting was probably legitimate. Um, it's just, oh God, it just seems like everybody who's been in Brazilian politics deserves to be in jail. I don't have a good solution, um, but yeah, Brazil should be, you know, at least, you know, the second most powerful country in the Americas and, you know, one of the five most powerful countries in the world just by virtue of size and resources. But with that political system, yeah, it'll be the country of the future forever. So, yeah, it just doesn't work. Uh, Haytham Chagwe asks, what do you think Tunisia needs right now? Um, for Tunisia, honestly, I think if it can just clear this next, Tunisia needs to hang on, um, is what Tunisia needs to do. The problem with Tunisia is the, just how screwed up its neighborhood is. Um, and even Europe. I mean, Europe has been mired in stagnation for 10 years now. Um, Libya is obviously, you know, its next door neighbor is obviously a nightmare. Um, Algeria has been quite stagnant since the oil price crash in 2014. So what I think Tunisia just needs to do is hang on. There are national elections again in, um, this year, I believe, uh, gosh, I should, I should, I should know the date, uh, for the Tunisian elections better. I do not, 
embarrassed because uh, I would like to cover those because it's something that I think is pretty important. Um, so what Tunisia has to do is hang on through those elections and hang on with this democratic system for a number of years because if Libya can finally reach peace, and I think there's a possibility, uh, I mean, Haftar may have sort of, uh, Saudi Arabia's general, uh, Haftar, may have sort of uh, uh, screwed up by attacking Tripoli. It didn't go as well or as quickly as he thought it would, so this could be the end of Haftar, who knows. Um, so when Libya becomes peaceful again, uh, Algeria, I think, uh, as I talked about last week in my video, has a real chance of, um, uh, has a real chance of uh, becoming a better system and a more prosperous system. So Algeria gets better, Libya gets better. Then Tunisia will finally start reaping the rewards of putting together this democratic functioning system with free speech, with free assembly, um, and will become a role model for the region. Um, and then, I mean, gosh, you know, Tunisians can help, uh, you know, can help set up, even now, I think Tunisians can work to help set up the better democratic systems of Algeria and Libya. Um, but unfortunately with Tunisia, such a small place, um, it's tremendously reliant on what it's larger, you know, physically larger, if not population larger, uh, neighbors do. It's reliant on what happens in the European economy. It's reliant on what happens in Libya. It's reliant on what happens in Algeria. So for Tunisia, it's, yeah, October 2019, uh, Haitham Chagwe says. So for Tunisia, I think it just has to get through October 2019 um, with a functioning system and hang on for another couple of years because things do look help hopeful in Algeria. Things do look hopeful in Libya. I mean, who knows? It could be another 10 years uh, before um, these places settle down and figure it out. It could be another 10 years before Europe um, figures out how to, how to bring back economic growth, but it might not be, you know, it could be quicker than that. And it'll be a real shame if Tunisia, uh, there's this classic, you know, if Tunisia sort of quit before the miracle happened, um, I mean, Tunisia's already done such incredible good work and, um, you know, continues to improve, continues to make things better. And it's so frustrating that everything around it is just such a disaster that Tunisia's good work has not been rewarded. Um, so it'd be a real shame if Tunisia sort of fell apart uh, or, you know, some kind of into some kind of dictatorship or violence or this sort of thing when Europe, you know, just as Europe finally turns the corner to economic growth or, or Algeria, you know, becomes a more real democracy or, or Libya becomes peaceful. It'd be a real shame if Tunisia sort of fell apart right before that. Um, so, yeah, my advice for Tunisia is just hang on, you know. Uh, Ophelia, Ophelia Balls asks, nice, Ophelia Balls, it's funny. Um, Ophelia Balls asks, um, any thoughts about Morocco? I was impressed they had a teacher strike a while back, although it didn't go well. That's a really interesting thing about a lot of these North African countries with um, sort of French, uh, a lot of French influences. Uh, the, uh, the labor union in um, uh, the labor union in Tunisia, for example, is tremendously powerful and very significant. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, it's sort of an interesting aspect of these societies that they're, they're already kind of hybrid sort of modern economies. Um, I have a lot of thoughts about Morocco, but I haven't, and I visited Morocco, which I found really interesting uh, about two years ago. Um, but I don't have enough with Tunisia, Libya, um, and uh, Tunisia, Libya, and Algeria. Um, I had a lot of uh, very confirmed ideas of what I wanted to say about those countries. I don't have a confirmed idea of what I want to say about Morocco. I'm sort of cautiously optimistic, uh, some ways pessimistic. Um, I think in a lot of ways it's better. It's actually in a, in a lot of ways it's in better shape than either of the, any of the other three countries. But there's just so much, you know, from the Western Sahara to, you know, it, it's, you know, frozen conflict with Algeria uh, that I need to do more research on before I can do a Morocco video. I think I'm, uh, probably next week I'm going to be talking about North Africa generally, and it, it bugs me that I haven't covered Morocco yet, but I just haven't done the reading yet. And I don't, won't have the time to do the reading um, in the next couple months. So I would like to talk about Morocco at some length at some point, but not... Um, it's not going to be this month. So 
I don't have really a conflict. Um, Michael Hanna asks, have you been to any of these Middle Eastern countries you talk about? I lived in Turkey for six years. I've been to Lebanon. Uh, I've been to Egypt. I've been to uh, Algeria. I've been to Tunisia. I've been to Morocco. Um, I've never been to Saudi Arabia, which people uh, obviously um, you know, try to hold against me. But I've found that, honestly, like, I knew people who lived in Turkey for six years and didn't know a fucking thing about Turkey. <laughs> um, and I think you can actually learn a great deal about the world by reading books. Um, I would say that, well, actually, yeah, I mean, my probably positive take on Algeria, my take on Algeria probably wouldn't have been as positive as it was if I hadn't actually visited Algeria and seen the extraordinary potential of that place. Um, so yeah, I mean, is it is it a problem that I haven't been to Saudi Arabia? At this point, I can't go to Saudi Arabia. Uh, um, I would think they're probably aware of me at this point. I mean, I've got literally millions of views for anti-Saudi, uh, you know, propaganda. Propaganda, yeah, it's fair. Um, so uh, if they let me in their country, they'd be nuts. Um, but uh, yeah, I have been, you know, like I said, the, the, I lived in Turkey for six years and I've, that allowed me to meet people from all of these places. Um, and I think from the basis of living in Turkey and from meeting many, I mean, many Syrian refugees, many, uh, many Arabs, many uh, folks from these countries, I think I, well, I'm certainly more equipped to uh, uh, express opinions on these places than any cable news channel in the United States. The amount of fucking people in um, the United States who hold themselves out as experts on these countries and regions on the strength of it really nothing um, is, is outrageous. Um, so yeah, I mean, sure. Obviously there's, there's a sort of a quasi imperial angle um, or uh, you know, some arrogance in um, you know, some white guy talking with such confidence about these countries. I'm well aware of that. Um, and uh, not really much I can sort of do about that. Um, but I think what does make my, Interpretation is more valid is I'm not rooted in any particular ideology. I'm not um, working for some corporation that, you know, uh, depends on advertisements from U.S. military contractors. Like I am, I think, trying to more independently and more honestly understand these countries than um, really anybody else in the United States. Okay, that's a little arrogant, um, but really... Uh, it's, uh, uh, I think I, I think I provide a valuable service in that respect, but, um, yeah. Um, questions, 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 comments on, uh, whether it's appropriate for a white guy to be uh, talking about these countries this way. I'd love to hear what you guys think. Um, uh, Fadel Goeta asks, do you think the U S will have a universal healthcare system in the next five years? You know, it's weird for a guy who, you know, still describes himself as conservative. Uh, I've now pretty much come around it. I freaking hope so. Uh, I think it's time. I think we deserve it. Um, I think it's absurd that the U.S. sort of healthcare system subsidizes um, health R&D for, you know, the whole world. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm actually a supporter of that now. And I think that the fact that I, someone who describes himself as a conservative, um, uh, can now be for universal health care, I think is indicative of a shift that's happening in the United States. It was really interesting to see the Republicans, after promising repealing Obamacare for uh, 10 years, couldn't, so they just flat out couldn't because, you know, their pollsters, their, uh, uh, their supporters told them that if they repealed Obamacare, they'd be done. Um, so, yeah, I think that some kind of, uh, you know, I'm, I have no real interest in the job guarantee or the Green New Deal or any, you know, free college or any of these other sort of proposals that are being made. But I think universal health care has a distinct possibility. Um, I actually thought, and I think this is what Steve Bannon wanted to do, was that uh, Trump would be sort of break, really basically break American politics for all time by, you know, instituting uh, uh, socialized health care. Thankfully, he wasn't smart enough to do that. Um, so, um, because, you know, if those guys had put in sort of socialized healthcare, it would have come with 
you know, an extreme, uh, even more extreme turn towards a sort of fascist anti people of color politics that uh, um, would have been really horrifying to see. And I'm glad that didn't happen. Um, so yeah, I think there's a possibility, you know, I, it's funny, I've spent so much time uh, focusing, um, you know, I'm writing a book called Avoiding the British Empire, sort of focusing on 19th century, uh, the world in the 19th century. And obviously I do the videos that are really focused on the Middle East. And I do the, um, that I am really out of touch with US politics. Like, while I personally think that it's time for universal healthcare, you know, stuff I see on Twitter leads me to believe that it, it, it's a possibility. I'm not as I'm not as dialed in as I should be, um, and also that's because I've made a commitment to not fucking cover the 2020 election in the United States until 2020. Like uh, 10 months of U.S. election coverage uh, from me will be enough. Um, so once I finish this book, which should you know happen in the next month or so, um, I'll continue to uh, you know do videos about the British Empire and do videos about uh, you know the Middle East and, and Venezuela, this, that, and the other thing. But I'll also start doing the necessary reading to get myself back up to speed on US politics. And I'll be able to talk more about um, what the possibilities are as far as universal healthcare. Because yeah, it's really, I mean, you have to go back to 2016 and I've got a whole playlist of 2016 election coverage. And I think I was fairly, you know, on top of what was going on back then. But uh, yeah, I'm just not, I'm not spending as much time on US politics, mostly because I hate the whole Trump-Russia thing. So I don't pay much attention to it. Okay, Nobozaji has thoughts on the conflict in Western Sahara. No, I need, I need to have thoughts on the conflict in Western Sahara, obviously. And I just haven't uh, had the opportunity to develop those thoughts, do the reading, so sorry. Stefan asks, when will the book be published? Ah, oh, God. Um, I'm hoping June. I'm fucking praying June. Um, I'm, I've got like really like less than two weeks of work that needs to be done, but that's been the case for two months now. The work just keeps sort of um, metastasizing. Uh, so yeah, I need to finish it and then I need to send it off to John Coombs uh, to edit it. Um, and then, so yeah, it, be it had better be out by, it had better be out by July. It had better be out by June. Um, we'll see. Uh, it's now like two years late at this point. Uh, James Cook asks, uh, more Freedom Foundation, what do you think of Caspian Report? Uh, I love Caspian Report. I think Caspian Report is great. Um, I think they are, uh, I think uh, Shervin is, uh, I think, probably a more serious commentator than I am. You know, like I, I sort of um, express and back up opinions um, and I think make arguments that I believe in strongly. But Shervin really like, he's like what, you know, he's like the, the model of like a, you know, mid 20th century unbiased American reporter, even though he's based in Azerbaijan, he really like dives in and uh, uh, tries to present what's going on in like a super objective fashion. Um, and uh, yeah, I really, li I really like Caspian Report. Um, that's usually, I mean, that's definitely Whenever I'm researching a video, uh, whatever Shervan, uh, Shervan, whatever Caspian report, whatever Caspian report has said about something is definitely a part of my research. Uh, big fan, big fan of Caspian report. Um, Khalil from Tunisia asks, "What do you think about the show on YouTube, Secular Talk, and his host Kyle Kalinsky?" Um, I, you know, I haven't spent a ton of time consuming uh, Kyle Kalinsky stuff. Um, I, I mean, I. You know, it's interesting. I do these live shows where I sort of respond to stuff um, because you guys like it, um, and because uh, I uh, it's really good for the YouTube algorithm. Um, but what Kalinsky does is something that I don't really. It's not really something that I really, really like to consume because it seems like he he has an opinion on everything. You know, he's sort of like you know, and he's got a very distinct worldview, and he wants to talk about this, that, and everything, and he responds to news and. That's not really what I do, um, and it's not really uh, – what I try to do is I try to put forward, not in this, obviously, but in my more produced videos, I try to put forward, like, the product of weeks or months of reading, uh, a lifetime of reading and perspective. And, I mean, this is what I do all week is I mostly just read history and write about it. Um, uh, and try and sort of like distill the lessons of history for 
what's going on now. I mean, that's what I do. Um, and like this sort of just being constantly on and responding to everything and having a, 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 a part to play and a place to fight uh, from in a given controversy is not really my bag. Um, so yeah, I mean, I've never, uh, certainly I've never been pissed off by anything Kyle Kowinski has said. I think that a lot of what he, but I haven't really watched much either. Um, I've really enjoyed some of his treat, tweets on uh, Trump Russia. I thought uh, he's uh, really done a good job of being like, this is freaking ridiculous, but also not uh, going really super overboard like some other people on the left who've known that it's super ridiculous, like Michael Tracy, who like has apparently like, you know, weirdly morphed into a Fox News commentator because, um, uh, you know, he's so angry about Trump Russia stuff. Anyway, weird. Um, that gets a little too far into the Twitter reads. Um, let's see, have we got questions, 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 questions. Do, 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 do. Uh, Kamal Nyinga John asks, I hope I got that right. Sorry, I missed the initial part of the live show. Didn't know you were posting. What's your schedule? Um, so I uh, am doing, when I do a live show, I post it on Twitter at Rob Law and I post it on the Facebook uh, page a couple, um, uh, a couple, we, a couple days ahead of time, usually. Um, and basically I try to do a live show once a month now because um, it's really good for the uh, YouTube algorithm, as I said. Um, and, um, but I don't really know that it's going to be the week that I'm going to do it um, until a couple of days beforehand. Um, I just got really in on the book and I was like, Oh, it's been, it's been about a month since I did a live thing. I'll just keep on working on the book rather than doing another video, which can take 15 to 20 hours. Um, so I do a video every Tuesday um, without fail uh, since March of 2014, I have done a video every Tuesday. Um, usually most weeks it's a produced video. It's in a sort of a five, 10 minute presentation that I've put a lot of work and time and thought into. Uh, but yeah, once a month, um, on a non none to uh, rigorous schedule, I will do a live chat. Um, so that's, uh, that's what goes on with the schedule. I hope that's helpful. Uh, Yashar Shokui asks, what is your view on the potential war between U.S. and co. and Iran? Do you think there is an appetite in the United States for a new war? There is no appetite in the United States for a new war. It is extraordinary, however, how concerted the effort from Fox News, CNN, every cable news channel, um, most of talk radio, and the U.S. government is to bring about a war with Iran. It's really, I mean, just people who... People I know who um, uh, are generally, you know, people I respect, you know, generally people who are intelligent, you know, things they're just like, oh, well, we're just going to have to go to war with Iran eventually. Um, and I'm like, why? What? Huh? Why would we have to go to war with Iran? And they don't actually have anything to back it up. Like, oh, well, Iran's definitely going to get a nuke sometime. It's like, and these are people who can't name a single person in Iranian government. It's just, um, it's a prejudice that has been beaten into people's heads by um, US media um, and US government. Uh, so I think that that sort of just insane brainwashing is conflicting with um, the fact that the US people still remember and are very aware of what an idiotic, waste of time, lives, and money, Iraq and Afghanistan. So I think there's even, I mean, even Donald Trump himself, though I know, I mean, the fact that he's still got Bolton and Pompeo in there makes it very possible uh, that war is going to happen. But I do think that even Trump himself is resistant of the idea, to the idea of going to war with Iran. Um, it's a possibility. It's always been a possibility. Um, there's been a lot of t chatter this week that you know makes it seem like more of a possibility. I don't know. I'm, I'm suspicious of that sort of stuff. Um, but yeah, is it a possibility? For sure, it's a possibility. I've got a video um, how the war with Iran was supposed to go from about three months back. Um, that's worth watching on this topic. Um, Pimp Asaurus Plum asks, do you think if the U.S. invades Iran tomorrow, most Americans would actually care? I would say absolutely. Yes, I think if the U.S. invades Iran tomorrow, people would actually care. 
because U.S. soldiers and U.S. ships would start dying very quickly. Um, and that gets the Americans to pay attention. It's really the only thing that gets the Americans to pay attention. Um, if um, could, so I don't think a real invasion of Iran is, is a possibility uh, or a likelihood. I think what is a possibility is a conflict between um, Iran and uh, the United States in Syria and Iraq. So if that was done mostly through special forces and cruise missiles, you know, it's quite possible that it could happen without the U.S. public even noticing, I mean, significantly, or without the U.S. paying much attention. Like, you know, the, the week it starts happening, people will be like, oh, but as long as, like, lots of U.S. soldiers aren't dying, they won't pay much attention. And I think that cynicism is unfortunately uh, pretty justified. Um, which active separatist movement anywhere on the planet do you view as the most significant as of May 2019? That's from Donovan Brown. Wow, that's a great question. Hmm. Um, I mean, probably the Kurds generally, I guess. <clears throat> I mean, because they've got the most institutional weight behind them. Um, I'm kind of worried about Ethiopia. Um, Ethiopia has been trying this extraordinary democratic experiment over the uh, over the past year or so under President Abi Ahmed. Is that correct? Um, but there's still like just tremendous um, sectional forces in the country, so that could be significant if that fails. That would make me very sad. Haitham um, Chagwe asks, "Do you think the Tunisian economy can recover and be competitive? It becomes capitalist." Uh, yes, I do. Um, I think, yes, absolutely. But uh, once again, I think the main factor in Tunisia's economic failure over the past eight years is European um, disintegration. Uh, there's disintegration of the European economy and um, uh, the, dis the physical disintegration of its two big neighbors, Libya and Algeria. Uh, Algeria has not uh, physically disintegrated, but it has its economy is disintegrated because of the decline in the oil price. <sighs> Flat Screen Gamer asks, do you watch pro wrestling and did you see John Oliver's episode on uh, WWE? Uh, I do not watch pro wrestling. I did see John Oliver's episode on WWE. Um, I, wa I watched, I remember watching the WWF as a kid in the heyday of Hulk Hogan and Andre the Giant. But uh, that, was all, that was all a very long time ago. Um, I, uh, I still read comic books a lot. I'm not a WWE guy. Um, uh, Sergen Durgut asks, what do you think of Turkey's local election? Um, I sort of talked about that at length above. I think it's pretty, actually I did an entire live chat on that a month ago um, where I talk about that at great length. Uh, so I think it's, yeah, Turkey's elections. I think the thing that it was, are Turkey's elections the end of Erdogan? Uh, the answer is no. Um, but uh, I was tremendously optimistic about the um, fact that the opposition parties took power in Istanbul and Ankara. And I'm very, very disappointed and saddened by the news that Erdogan is going to try and rerun the election in Istanbul. Uh, Stefan asks, do you play football? Um, I played American football for a couple of years in high school um, and then uh, quit to focus on theater and my drinking. Um, but no, I'd, uh, uh, presumably, uh, if you're anywhere in the country other than the United States, you're actually talking about football, uh, what the Americans call soccer. Uh, and I am no good at football. Um, I am uh, I'm a large uh, individual who is good at sports that uh, require uh, brutality and uh, also sports that require endurance strength. I was a pretty... Well, technically not very good. I was a pretty formidable rower in college. Um, but uh, no, as far as like flitting around a field and kicking balls and this, that, you know, grace and, and uh, that sort of thing, yeah, no, I've got none of that. Um, uh, I remember my uh, uh, Turkish, uh, I worked for a Turkish law firm and uh, we had a like friendly game against um, some other law firm and they made me play football and it was embarrassing. It was like they were shot. I could see that they all thought of me as less of a man because I was so bad at kicking kicking a soccer ball. Um, so yeah, no, I am not a football player. Um, I was an American football player. 
uh, <laughs> uh, Hamid Iron S Ice Hockey. Uh, I think I did that for like a uh, very briefly as like a seven year old and didn't like it. Um, Omid Pakbaz uh, asks, um, do you think Iran is Iraq before 1992? I'd say no. Um, I think uh, Iran both has infinitely more uh, legitimacy, as little as it does have, uh, infinitely more legitimacy than Saddam Hussein does. Um, and I think it's a more functioning real economy, or it could be if the US would stop destroying it. Um, yeah, this idea that Iran, there are a lot of fantasies about the weakness of the Iranian regime that are endorsed by um, uh, a bunch of uh, warmongers in Washington, D.C. that I just don't think are accurate. Um, I think Egypt might be Iran before 1979, but that's a different, you know, different question. Um, Kamun Yenga John asks, with all the separatist movements in the world, is a modern federation possible, especially involving East Africa with all of our numerous tribes? Man, I don't know. I need to, I, I've just been reading, uh, because of uh, the book I'm writing on the British Empire, I've been sort of diving in on uh, East African issues, and I am, I can't even begin to, to talk about those seriously, I'm afraid. Um, so no, I, I can't, uh, Africa is something I desperately want to understand more. I, you know, I'm slowly working my way there. You know, I've sort of worked around from Turkey to Syria, to Saudi Arabia, to North Africa. And I hope to begin to start, uh, one of the nice things about covering Sudan or, uh, also Morocco on the other side of the continent is that by covering those issues, which I think are definitely countries that are high on my list. I start creeping down a little further into um, into sub-Saharan Africa, and uh, also uh, I really want to talk about uh, Ethiopia more because I just want to know more about what's going on in Ethiopia. So hopefully, I'll be able to begin to work towards uh, speaking to the issues that confront East Africa. But uh, I am nowhere near uh, able to do that. So sorry. Um, <laughs> Questions, questions, questions. Logo Cool Extreme asks, Mo Freedom Foundation, how does the people of Jeddah and Riyadh benefit from Saudi policy? Um, that's a, well, Riyadh obviously benefits from Saudi policy because Riyadh is a city that wouldn't exist without sort of the Saudi Arabian state. I mean, it's something absurd. Like in 1900, there were like 10,000 people in Riyadh. It's completely, uh, uh, completely reliant on the Saudi state and petroleum wealth from elsewhere in the country to exist. Jeddah is interesting. Jeddah is a port city, I believe, on oh gosh, geography. Uh, to the um, is that the per oh no, yeah, I can't. I can't. Apparently, can't remember the names of seas now. But it is a port country. It is a port city on the uh, far west of the country that traditionally has its own independent, vibrant culture. And as sort of my understanding is sort of seen as more, uh, for lack of a better word, sort of more liberal, more free than the rest of the country. I mean, Jeddah is a place that, uh, you know, would probably flourish outside of the context of the Saudi Arabian state. Um, there was a Caspian Report video, um, the geopolitics of Saudi Arabia from a couple months back. It's really good on that. Um, <laughs> Uh, Borhan Hoggard asks, Borhani Hoggard asks, do you think Berber North African countries would be better out of the corrupt Arab League? Um, no, I don't think, uh, I mean, I, Arab League is just, at this point, is just, it, it's, it's a talking shop. It doesn't have real significant um, sort of powers. I mean, I would love it if there were sort of uh, some moves towards an Arab customs union or... Uh, free trade area or something like that, but the Arab League doesn't even have that. Uh, sure, there's a lot of corrupt, nasty elements of the Arab League, but I don't think, um, there's never a benefit to not talking to people. Um, you know, it's a, the Arab League, to my mind at this point, is just a means of communication and it should be kept open. So no, I don't think anybody should drop out of the Arab League. Um, Let's see, uh, when you say you are conservative, what does that mean as far as social norms, economically, all of the above, or what? Thanks. 
S three hundred thirty six hundred. You know, it's interesting. I'm becoming less economically uh, conservative, as uh, some of you have uh, pointed out in the comments. Uh, you know, I'm I'm totally okay with socialized medicine now. But generally, I am. Um, you know, I'm a small government person. I think that uh, um, generally, as general principle, uh, larger government participation in economies can be problematic. However. You know, as I cruise into my uh, 40s, um, you know, and I've seen more of the world, I'm no longer like a fundamentalist about that. I'm not like, oh, yeah, fuck the government, you know, anarcho-capitalism. I think that's absurd, um, having actually seen something of the world. So uh, while I am against big government, I am no longer for bad government. Uh, because I think this fight against big government that the Republicans have been involved in for the past 40 years, in practice, just leads to bad government. Um, in, in practice leads to a stupider Congress, to um, uh, worse institutions that are more open to being corrupted and bought by the people that they're regulating. So um, but my principles still are um, for smaller government, uh, for better government, but uh, they're not as unthinking as they used to be. I don't describe myself as a libertarian anymore, though I once did. Um, I am, I do have some social conser socially conservative instincts actually um i do um wonder about you know the decay of family um in the united states uh while i am uh you know the fact that people just don't get married anymore um people who don't reproduce um, i think that's a real problem um though honestly that's one of the things that's pushing me towards more uh more lefty economic ideas because i think it's a lot of um the failure of sort of traditionally fiscally conservative policies um, is the reason why, uh, you know, nobody can afford to have kids anymore. Um, so that's sort of interesting. But I do have some socially conservative. I am agnostic. I have no, um, uh, you know, I'm culturally Christian, I guess. Um, you know, I go to Christian weddings and funerals. Um, but uh, um, I have no real affection for any kind of religion personally, but uh, but I do think that it, it has played an important role in uh, U.S. society. And I think uh, probably the main, I mean, the Republicans have really actively destroyed uh, Christian power by turning it so transparently political. It's really amazing that uh, Christianity is plummeting in the United States because they tried, the Republicans tried to turn it into a political tool. Um, that's what they did since Reagan. And it's, it's really interesting. You can watch like the, it's hard to graph the politi politicization of Christianity, but it's clearly something that's been on the upswing since, since Reagan. Um, and as that has ha happened more, the number of people who are actually Christian in the United States has plummeted. And that's not an immigration thing, um, because most immigrants have been Latino and those are more religious people. Um, so, uh, uh yeah, it's, uh, I do worry about that sort of thing, but I am always sort of a freedom first kind of person. Um, so while, yeah, you know, I kind of like it if, you know, maybe people were, you know, had the community of religion more or, you know, families were still, uh, you know, more important, more people had kids, um, as I say, as a 40 year old sitting in an apartment uh, for 20 somethings. But anyway, um, the uh, I'm sort of blathering, but uh, yeah, I mean, there's more to my conservatism, conservatism uh, than uh, any kind of than can be summed up in any kind of platform. I did. There's a video I have from like three or four years back called "A Conservative Manifesto." You know, I'm big on the Constitution. I'm big on uh, the U.S. potential for good in the world. Um, I think those are conservative instincts. Um, however, I'm very conscious that, uh, you know, the U.S. government and even the Republican Party specifically has pissed all over um, that potential for U.S. good in the world, uh, certainly since 9-11 and really for some time before as well. But anyway, so, yeah, I'm just blathering. But I still do consider myself a conservative, um, even though uh, many conservatives would dispute that. Um, okay. Do, 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 do. Eric S. Do you believe Wilsonianism will end in U.S. foreign policy? God, I hope so. That'd be lovely, wouldn't it? Um, no, I don't. Sadly, um, I mean Wilsonianism is sort of this idea of it's sort of two things, and there there is 
you know, at its outset, you know, the promise of Wilsonianism was a respect for self-determination and, and independence for all peoples. And uh, that's still a valid uh, promise, and that's a fantastic thing. But what Wilsonianism was in practice was the United States, you know, going out in the world and telling everybody how it had to be. Um, I think that, well, I hope that the more positive aspects of Wilsonianism that lean towards freedom for all peoples, no matter how small, no matter how weak, um, that's an instinct that I hope continues. Um, but the whole, the real face of Wilsonianism, the U.S. running around telling everybody what to do, that's going to, you know, become less of a factor over the course of this century um, as the U.S. gets less powerful. <sighs> Victory asks, what will be the consequences if Iran closes the Strait of Hormuz? Uh, man, fuck if I know. Um, the interesting thing is that Iran is well, yeah, uh, what the Trump administration, so the thing that's always um, protected the Strait of Hormuz is the fact that Iran needs to export oil through the Strait of Hormuz, um, as does Saudi Arabia and a range of other oil countries. Um, so if the Trump administration is successful, which they're unlikely to be, but if they're successful in crushing Iranian exports to zero, then Iran has no incentive uh, to keep the Strait of Hormuz open. Um, so yeah, that would obviously be a tremendously, um, it would send oil prices through the roof, that's for sure. Um, it would um, lead to a lot of destruction, that's for sure. But as far as, yeah, I, I just don't know. I don't know. It would be interesting, that's for fucking sure. Um, I am Diari asks, is there a chance for Kurdish governance in Syria? There is a chance. I think that um, the future of Rojava, the future of, uh, oh yeah, uh, victory. Yeah, if obviously if Iran closes the Strait of Hormuz, there will be a war between the United States and Iran. No question. Um, but yeah, I am Diari, is there a choice, chance for Kurdish governance in Syria? Um, is there a chance? Uh, yes. The main chance for Rojava, the main chance for, oh God, I can never remember the acronyms, but the main chance for the Kurdish, the Syrian Kurds is making a good deal with Assad. That's the, that's the so they might have some, might be able to hold on to some degree of independence. Um, I think the longer that they, you know, allow themselves to be the US proxy in Syria, the less likely that, that possibility um, is. So yeah, uh, Syria, the independence for the Syrian Kurds is not a possibility. Um, some degree of autonomy is a possibility. Um, and that their, their guarantee and possibility of that autonomy comes through Assad, not the US government. Though perhaps the US could uh, guarantee that autonomy to some degree. Uh. <laughs> Chinggis Khan says, I'm leaving for the sole reason that your goggles are very disturbing. My goggles, my, my sunglasses, my hair is very unruly. Sorry, that's a problem. Um, do you think democracy can work in sub-Saharan Africa? Should it be easier than ideological dictatorships of China, Islamic countries? I absolutely think democracy can work in sub-Saharan Africa. I do wonder, I think with Ethiopia um, specifically is, did it happen too soon? Is Ethiopia still, so, still too poor? Um, I hope not. I hope that it, I hope that, uh, um, because I think there's tr sort of a traditional democratization theory argues that um, it's sort of a, at around 8,000, you know, GDP per capita, around $8,000 GDP per capita, uh, most countries tend to turn more democratic. Uh, I think Ethiopia is still, even after incredible rise, I think they're still under 1,000 uh, GDP per capita. So I don't know. Um, if Ethiopia can successfully pull this off, then holy shit. I mean, that just explodes a lot of what people thought. Um, and yeah, democracy is super possible for like everybody in Africa. And that's amazing. Um, you know, it's uncomfortable because I'm very pro-democracy, but uh, I think that for a very poor country, you know, a more authoritarian system can yield more economic development, but it can also yield incredible stagnation um, and, and screw up. It's, you're back to monarchy and you're dependent on the personality of whoever's in charge. So I'm very pro-democracy for all of Africa. I think it's very possible. Um, so yeah. 
Um, that's an interesting question. Um, Local Cool Extreme asks, who deserves more blame for the spread of Wahhabism, the United States or Saudi Arabia? Um, I think it's both. Um, obviously, it's impossible without Saudi Arabia, but it would have been impossible without the U.S. protection and uh, maintenance of Saudi Arabia as an independent state. Uh, so it's both. Um, I can't really give you a percentage on whether the United States or Saudi Arabia is more to blame for the spread of Wahhabism, but they both are. Uh, Mohammed El Ziadani says, Saudi Arabia and Libya, what do you think? Um, I think it's very much a part of what I was talking about in the presentation today. Uh, Saudi Arabia is doing its damnedest to install another strongman in Libya with Haftar because they do not want um, the government of national accord uh, that the United Nations has helped send up, set up. They don't want that to succeed. They want that to fail. And that's what Haftar is about. Uh, I did a video about that last week. Um, Badis Gulia asks, what do you think of the Greater Israel Project in the Middle East? I think it's a bit of a fantasy. Um, I think the other sort of big, uh, I think the Yanon plan, um, which is something that actually exists, um, is, I think, something that's a little more worth focusing on. I think Israel has actively facilitated um, the destruction of places like Syria and Iraq. Um, the degree to which that was intentional or part of a broader plot is very, very debatable. I think that's more interesting. This greater Israel project doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Now, if you're talking about a greater Israel that, um, uh, that uh, appropriates the land of Palestine, of the Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza, yeah, sure, that's a real greater Israel project that they're actively working on and, you know, they're trying to figure out how to, how to take that. Um, and uh, are, I think, fairly successful uh, in the West Bank at this point, uh, which is pretty horrifying. Um, but as far as I do think there's people who are like, oh, you know, Israel's going to control everything from Syria down to Iraq, and I think that's just ridiculous. Um, unless things get a lot worse very quickly, uh, we're not going to be in a position where, unless there's another great war or something like that, we're not going to be in a position where Israel can outright slaughter people. Um, so this idea that you know, they're gonna volunteer to add another 20 million Syrians to their, you know, to the, to the what was it, four or five million Palestinians they're failing to oppress uh, appropriately. Um, I, I think that's kind of silly, so. Um, sorry, failing to oppress successfully. Um, <laughs> okay. Questions, questions, questions. Um, MFF, is there any truth in King Salman worries concerning MBS possible coup or fake news? Uh, you know, uh, it's monarchy, man. It's Game of Thrones. It's, uh, sure, that's possible. It could be completely, I mean, MBS is, owes his position to King Salman. Um, King Salman has has put him in place is the source and font of all his power, um, especially considering the extraordinary screw ups that MBS has engaged in over the past, um, uh, over the past, the incredible screw ups that MBS has engaged in over the past year or so, I think he'd be insane to try to get rid of King Solomon at this point. Uh, later on, sure, I mean, it's monarchy. Uh, it's, it's a really stupid way to organize a country. And yeah, personal conflicts and the personality of the leaders are tremendously important. So yeah, I think it's a possibility, but not this year. Um, Local Cool Extreme, uh, at Mo Freedom Foundation, who deserves more blame for the spread of Wahhabism? The US or so, I answered that already. Um, yeah. um, Arif Hor, as Mo Freedom Foundation, what is your opinion of the channel visual politics? Um, I like them a lot. I think they're, uh, I think they're really interesting. It's in, you know, what is kind of, Fascinating is, um, I feel like they are much more libertarian, uh, you know. So I think I would have loved them ten years ago. I think they're a lot more libertarian than I am. Um, some I get that sense, like the fact that they seem to be like super anti uh, Maduro government in Venezuela is kind of interesting. Like, yeah, it's it's a weird it's a weird thing. That visual politic. I don't watch enough of their videos to really. Um, I mean, they have a very distinct style that somehow, you know, I occasionally, I mean, like how many 
screaming guitars can you listen to? I get a little irritated by. But I think a lot of their coverage is really interesting and it's definitely uh, taught me a lot of stuff. But I do feel like their uh, some of their their approaches on certain things are just like a little more libertarian or even more like sort of standard right wing than like you'd think from their presentation, which is kind of interesting. Um, but uh, they're pro-business and I'm pro-business. So um, I don't know, sometimes though, it's a little surprising. I think it was their Venezuela coverage in particular. It's just like, man, like they really, seem to be uh, like the economist as well like it's like super pro um or super super yeah basically super pro intervention in venezuela which bugs me i'll be honest um, i think that one of the greatest accomplishments of u.s foreign policy over the past 25 years is not invading or at least not being seen to invade or influence a latin american country and uh, the fact that i mean as bad as maduro is and he's bad i did a video on that uh, sort of like how Trump keeps saving Maduro, um, and Maduro is bad, don't get me wrong, um, but uh, I think it's not worth it to the United States to throw away, you know, almost three decades, you know, three decades without, without an invasion of, of a Latin American country. Because if we do invade Venezuela, it means that we're, we're back to square one and everybody's going to go left. Everyone in Latin America is going to go leftist again, and they're going to just be really angry about U.S. imperialism again, and they're going to be absolutely right. Um, so, yeah. Um, local cool extreme s oh, come on how can you be so pro immigration when immigrants steal jobs from Americans that's a silly question immigrants do not steal jobs from Americans immigrants keep the United States viable immigrants are you know if we're going to come out on top in this century long struggle with China um, it's going to be because of uh, uh, immigration um, the studies there are just so many studies. Um, talking about um, the fact that what immigrants do is they add to the economic pie. They make the pie bigger. It is true, however, that they can be bad for low-income people, in for unskilled workers in the country they come to. That is, I think, that, that has been demonstrated, and that's not good. Um, but uh, I think uh, the most important thing is... Uh, um, a world without poor people and uh, immigration makes that possible. I mean, I think that would be the best thing for low skilled workers is to have a world without poor people. Um, so there you go. Um, does Saudi have influence on the Uyghurs? That's very interesting. You know, it's interesting because Saudi Arabia, MBS, that's, uh, that's Bharat Reddy, uh, MBS and Saudi Arabia have very um, explicitly um, failed to be supportive of the um, uh, of the Uyghurs. Uh, they've just quite, you know, openly, uh, you know, said, "Oh, we don't care." But it's interesting because it's sort of Saudi ideologies that kind of got the Uyghurs into their current problem. It absolutely was sort of extremist Muslim. Now that's okay. I don't want to appear to be endorsing China's line that. These, their concentration camps are justified because uh, the Uyghurs got super conservative, but um, they wouldn't even have that, um, that justification if it weren't for Saudi radicalization of Uyghur Islam, because Uyghur Islam was not, and you know, I, don't, I can't speak to exactly what, how uh, Islam is practiced, but there's no question that Saudi Arabian radicalization um, has been a factor in um, Uyghur in Uyghur in Xinjiang in you know East Turkestan in the sort of Uyghur territories of China, and that factor has made it easier for China to repress them. So. Uh, okay, um, folks, uh, it's been two solid hours. My voice is giving out and I have to be downtown at three o'clock. So I think I'm going to have to call an end to it. Uh, Robert Freed, you're, you're saying many things about immigration that I'd like to talk about, but uh, I just don't have the time. I would like to do at some point a deeper dive onto immigration because I think that there's a lot of uh, BS both on the left and the right in sort of how immigration is discussed. And I'd love to do a deeper dive on that at some point, but uh, now is not the time for that. Um, 
All right, thank you guys so much. Uh, my name is Robert Morris. I do uh, videos at the More Freedom Foundation every Tuesday without fail, once a month. It's sort of a live chat like this, but most of the time I do uh, produced shorter videos where I try to distill a lot of very independent study um, on a region, a country, an issue, and put it into a video uh, that can be uh, digested quickly and sort of teach you about the world. So that's what I try to do here at the Mo Freedom Foundation. Um, I am very poor at branding, uh, but can be found on Twitter at Robo Law. That's R O B B O L A W at Robo Law. Um, on Instagram at the Golden Age. Uh, I have an email list. I think I should be in the description of this video. Uh, I am completely dependent on uh, now. My channel is big enough that I do get some checks from Google for YouTube advertising, but that's not. I mean, that's. I think in a year it pays me enough for like a month of rent uh, in New York City. Uh, so I'm really dependent on both PayPal contributions and uh, Patreon, uh, my crowdfunding thing. So I'd be very uh, honored if uh, you folks would consider signing up for those. Uh, I also sell uh, essays, uh, probably the best of which would be Everybody's Lying About Islam, where I talk a lot about uh, the issues of Saudi Arabia, the U.S.-Saudi relationship, and the way that it has sort of created the whole a radical Islamic terrorism thing that's available on Amazon for the Kindle and in paperback. It's called Everybody's Lying About Islam. You can just Google that and the Amazon link will come up. Um, I'd recommend giving that a whirl. And uh, thank you. Um, this has been um, this has been great. Uh, I am super grateful to all you folks because none of this is possible uh, without you guys. Um, so I am signing off now.